This is Harsh Rules. I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to continue to learn to play Liberty or Death, the American Insurrection. Liberty or Death, the American Insurrection was released in 2016 by GMT Games and designed by Harold Buchanan. This game supports up to four players and takes from three to six hours to play. This is our third episode in the series covering Liberty or Death, so if you missed the first two episodes, you probably want to go back and check those out. Episode 1 provided an overview of the game, and Episode 2 taught how to set up the game and get ready for play. Now in Episode 3, we're going to look at the player's game actions called Commands and Special Activities. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Game actions are divided into Commands and Special Activities. Each faction's Command and Special Activity has a theme name and a specific impact on the game. From a game mechanics perspective, a command is a game action that the faction pays resources for. Under the right conditions, a special activity can then be chained to that command to introduce additional effects to the game. In many instances, multiple commands can be purchased and thus multiple special abilities. To keep track of them all, players can mark their intentions on the board with pawns. Players use gray pawns for commands and black pawns for special activities. With this in mind, let's review the sequence of play one more time before we dive in depth into the intricacies of each command and special activity. Event cards are used to execute the sequence of player actions that comprise the bulk of the game. At the bottom of the game board is a flowchart that organizes gameplay. Each faction is represented by a colored cylinder with their emblem, called an eligibility marker. At the beginning of a particular round, these cylinders are placed in the eligible faction space in this area. When an event card is drawn, the order of play of the factions is established at the top of the card. The first player will then choose which of the three paths to follow. They can choose to execute a command only, execute a command in a special activity, or trigger the event at the bottom of the card. The first player can also choose to pass and remain eligible. Passing also has the additional benefit of granting that player additional resources. For example, if the first faction chose command only no special activity, then the next faction would flow into the limited command box, unless they elected to pass, and then the next faction would flow into the limited command box, and so on. Before we proceed on to talking about each command and special activity, let's discuss the different options and strategies in this flowchart. Essentially, the first faction has three choices. They can select a command only, a command and a special activity, or trigger the event on the card. Depending on the sequence of factions at the top of the event card that has been drawn, the first faction may want to work with or against the second faction. For example, selecting the first two options removes the second faction from having access to a special activity. Choosing the first two options also restricts the second faction to a limited command. A limited command is many times a restriction on the number of times that a particular command can be purchased. However, selecting the third option and triggering the event allows the second faction a full command and special activity. As you can see, the sequences of play for the factions and the choices on the flowchart can create a variety of strategies and challenges. Although this is a team-based game in some respects, there are also times when you want to limit your partner's commands, events, or special activities that may allow them to meet their own objectives and win the game. Keep this structure in mind as we walk through each command and special activity. Rather than forcing you to learn everything by rote memorization, Instead, we will cover off on commands and special activities organized in themes on how a player interacts with the game. First, we will learn about the various game actions that allows a faction to place their game pieces. 
The British Standard Placement Command is called Muster. The Muster Command allows this faction to add British forces and build support. This command costs one resource per space. The Muster Command has a standard section of game effects with two additional options to choose from. The command's standard effects allows the British faction to place up to six British regulars and two Tories. British regulars can only be placed in city spaces that are not blockaded or in an adjacent colony space to the unblocked city. After the French Treaty of Alliance is played, British regulars can be placed in the West Indies. Tories can be placed in city and colony spaces containing or adjacent to British regulars or forts. Placement of Tories is limited to one if the space has passive opposition and is prohibited if the space is at active opposition. Tories cannot be placed in the West Indies. This command also offers a choice of two options. For option A, the British faction can choose to exchange three game pieces of either regulars or Tories for a British fort. Or the British faction can choose option B. With this option, they can pay to use their resources to reward loyalty and increase the level of support in the selected space. For each resource point spent, the influence in the space can be increased by one level of support. The Patriot command for placing units is called Rally. This command allows the Patriots to add or recover their forces and costs one resource per colony or city space, as long as those spaces do not have active support for the British. The Rally command is comprised of two set of options. So let's walk through each one a section at a time. The first set of options is for a space without a fort. For option A, the Patriot faction can place one militia in a city or a colony as long as it does not have active support for the British. Or for option B, the Patriots can exchange two game pieces of either Continentals or militia and build a fort. When a space has a fort, this unlocks two additional options for the Rally Command. Option C functions the same as Option A, except now with a fort, the Patriots' recruitment options increase. Now Patriots can place a number of militia units equal to the population of the city, or colony, plus the number of forts in the space. A space can have a maximum of two forts. Therefore, a space with a population of two and two forts could produce four militia units with this command. Or the Patriots can exercise option D and move adjacent militia units into the selected space. Also with this option, militia units in the selected space can conceal themselves. This flips militia units from their active side to their underground side. Finally, with a fort in this space, Patriots exercising either option can replace one militia unit with a continental. The Indian Faction's command for placing their war parties is called Gather. This command costs one resource unless the first space is a reserve. The Gather command has several options to choose from. For option A, the Indian Faction can place one war party in any neutral or passive city or colony or they can always be placed in a reserve. Or the Indian faction can choose option B and can exchange two war parties for a village. The advantage of a village is the Indian faction can now place an additional war party for each village in the space. And playing the gather command on a space with a village opens a third option. In option C, the Indian faction can now move war parties from adjacent spaces to the selected gather space. Also, the war parties in that space can conceal themselves and be flipped from active to underground status. French unit placement commands fall into two types, those before the Treaty of Alliance is played and those after. The first is called French agent mobilization. Since the French need to reach a specific force threshold before entering the war, this command allows them to help their Patriot allies in the interim. 
By paying one resource, the French can place two Patriot Militia units or one Continental unit. However, these units can only be placed in select French-friendly colonies. And they cannot be placed if that space's influence is at active support for the British. To assist in gameplay, these colonies' banners are identified with a French fleur symbol on top. Eligible colonies include Quebec, New York, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. The French faction's second unit placement command can be used after the Treaty of Alliance. This command is called Muster, but functions slightly differently than the British version. Muster costs the French faction one resource, and it allows them to place one to four French regulars into any colony or city with rebellion control or the West Indies. Also, if the Patriots agree to pay one resource, the French can exchange two of their regulars to create a Patriot fort. For unit placement, the French also have a special activity. This special activity can be chained to any command and is used before the Treaty of Alliance. This special activity is called pre prepare la guerre which, in my atrocious French, means prepare for war. This is a key special activity for the French before the Treaty of Alliance because it allows them to move three regulars from unavailable to available in the available French forces box. Or, the French can choose to place one squadron in the West Indies. Or finally, they can choose to increase their French resources by two. Now that we've learned the commands and special activities for placing units, let's learn how the factions move game pieces on the board. For the British faction, the primary command for moving units is March. March costs one resource to move units from one space to an adjacent space. March can be used to move regulars and Tory cubes. However, the number of Tories that can be moved is limited to a 1 to 1 ratio to the number of British regulars. Also for this command, for every three regulars or Tories in the destination space, they can reveal one underground militia in that space as well. The British can also use a special activity called Common Cause. Special activities do not cost resources. Instead, they are chained to eligible commands. The eligible commands for Common Cause are March or Battle. Common Cause allows the British to use Indian in war parties like Tories. When using this special activity, war parties can be marched along with regulars on a one-to-one -one basis. Or, they can be used to conduct battle. We will cover off on all the intricacies of the battle command a little later in the tutorial. The Indian faction also has a command called March. This version of March works similarly to other factions March commands with a few small exceptions. First, March can be conducted in any province at the cost of one resource. However, March is begun from a reserve can be completed for free. Also be aware that when underground war parties move into a territory space with four or more enemy cubes, all marching war parties are revealed and flip from underground status to active status. The Indian faction Scout Command allows them to move war parties along with British regulars and Tories. This command costs the Indian faction one resource and the British faction must also pay one resource for their units. When this command is used, all war parties in the space are revealed. For movement, any number of regulars can accompany the war parties, but Tories are limited to a one-to-one -one ratio to the British regulars. Also, this command allows the Indian faction to use British regulars to skirmish. We will cover off on skirmish in the Remove Pieces section of this tutorial. The Patriots version of March follows similar mechanics to other versions. The Patriot faction can move regulars and militia with this command at a cost of one resource per destination space. 
One notable difference is that the Patriot March can bring along French regulars at a one-to-one -one ratio, one French regular to one Patriot Continental. However, the French need to pay for the movement of their pieces as an additional expense. Like other groups, marching cubes entering a space can reveal underground war parties, but this time at a ratio of 2 to 1. So for every two cubes, one war party is flipped from underground to active status. Also be aware that when marching underground militia into a city that is British controlled, those militia units can be revealed if the total number of pieces in the group plus the enemy cubes in that space exceed three in number. When that number is achieved, then all militia in the group are revealed. The French faction's march ability is similar to the Patriot March. Marching French regulars can bring Patriot Continentals with them at a ratio of 1 to 1. However, the Patriot faction must pay one resource as well for their units. An extra function of march for the French faction is a special maneuver that allows them to move from any rebellion-controlled city or adjacent space to another rebellion-controlled city or adjacent space. Although it is not stated, my assumption is this ability is thematically connected to the French Navy in the area. In any case, this can allow the French player to help the Patriots get around the map quickly. Now that we know how to place pieces and move them, let's learn how to remove enemy pieces. Now, let's discuss the most complex command in the game, the Battle Command. This command costs the initiating faction one resource except for the Indian faction which cannot initiate battles, but can participate in them. More on that in just a second. The initiator then becomes the attacker and they must name another faction on the opposing side as the defender. Battles themselves can occur anywhere on the board, but the French and British are the only factions that can initiate battles in the West Indies. So let's take a few moments to walk through how to conduct a battle. First, the faction leading the battle must pay their resources to initiate the battle and declare the faction they are attacking who becomes the defender. In our overly simplistic example here, we're having the Patriots initiate the battle and they'll need to pay. They've identified the British as the defender. Next, each side's second faction then decides whether they will participate. On the rebellion side, the French would need to pay to join the battle with the Patriots. The rules, of course, would be reversed if the French initiated the battle. On the royalist side, the Indians are the sole faction that do not have to pay to join the British in a battle. Remember, the Indians cannot initiate a battle themselves. However, they can be chosen as the primary defender. Once the resources are paid, it's time to determine the units that will be fielded. Let's walk through each section so the nuances of the classes are clear. Soldier units, essentially cubes, are divided into leaders and subordinates. The leader can field all his cubes. The subordinate can only field cubes at a ratio of 1 to 1 to the leader. In this example, the French regulars are subordinate to the Continentals because the Patriots initiated the battle. These roles would be reversed if the French initiated the battle. On the British side, the subordinate is always the Tory units. Each cube unit that is fielded is worth one point towards the force level. Next, the guerrilla units, in other words, the octocylinder militia and war party pieces, are units that must be activated to be fielded in the battle. Players can activate as many of these units as they want to participate. A quick tip, there is a bonus modifier later for keeping at least one of these units underground. Now, guerrilla type units do not have the training and extensive experience of their soldier counterparts. So to calculate the force level contribution of these units, the unit number is totaled divided in half and then rounded down. Therefore, you need at least two of these guerrilla type units to score one point towards the force level. 
Finally, bases, which are forts and villages, are only included for the defender and are worth one point each. Add the points from each section together to get your force level total. The force level number is going to tell us the number of dice we get to roll to determine the casualties. A force level of 1 to 2 provides no dice to the player. Once the force level exceeds 3 though, the total is divided by 3 and rounded down. This result tells you the number of D3 die to roll. Now D3 die are just six-sided dice with results of 1 to 3 on them. Each side will take these dice, roll them, and sum the results to come up with their casualty removal number. These casualty removal numbers are essentially a total used to eliminate game pieces on the enemy's side. However, these gross numbers can be further modified by unit participation in the battle and unique situations on the board. The following table lists these occurrences and how the casualty result is modified. For example, if half the attacking forces are French regulars, then that side adds one additional casualty point to the die results. However, if the defending British faction has a fort in the battle space, then that plus one is nullified by a negative one. Once all the modifiers have been added into the casualty removal totals, then it's time to remove the actual casualties. Each game piece is worth a specific value towards meeting casualty removal totals. Continentals, regulars, and forts are worth two points each, and every other game piece is worth one point each. Each side has a unique casualty flow that dictates the sequence of unit types that must be sacrificed to meet the casualty removal total. For example, for rebellion casualties, they alternate between continentals and French regulars. Once all these units are depleted, and if the rebellion is defending, then any forts can be removed. The royalist casualty flow is a little more complex. First, the royalists alternate between cubes until depleted, then move on to war parties, until those are gone, then villages if they're defending, and finally forts if they're defending. Next, let's talk about what to do with the casualties that have been lost in the battle. Once you have your casualties sorted out, you will want to divide them into two groups. Cubes and stars count as objective casualties. This refers to the objective for the European interests that track the cumulative rebellion and cumulative British casualties. Place these units in the casualty space, total them up, and then update the markers. Once this is done, return the forts to the appropriate available forces space on the board. The cubes will remain in the casualty space until the reset period during the next winter quarters round. Militia, war parties, and villages are non-objective casualties and are not counted towards the secondary objective for European interests. These pieces are returned immediately to their available forces spaces on the game board. The final potential game impact for a battle command is called win the day. This impact is triggered if the loser removes a cube or a fort or removes two plus game pieces and this cannot occur if the battle was in the West Indies. If these conditions are met, then determine the winner. It's either the side that lost the least pieces, and this count excludes militia and war party pieces. Unless one side is eliminated, then the surviving side wins. Or the defender wins if losses are equal. However, if both sides are eliminated, then there is no winner. Once the winner is decided, it's time to shift the support or opposition in the battle space. The level is shifted by half the number of pieces the loser removed, rounding down. If Washington is in play, then you double those results to a maximum of six. Once the battle space is fully shifted to either active support or active opposition, then any remaining shift levels overflow into adjacent spaces. An additional special ability is that Patriot winners may then rally for free and move their units to the battle space, 
If the French faction won the battle in a blockaded city, they may then move that blockade to another city. And that's how the battle command functions. Now let's look at some other special activities that can also remove pieces. The British can also remove enemy game pieces with the skirmish special activity. This special activity can be used in any province, but not in a space where a battle, garrison, or muster command has been played. With skirmish, the British faction will use their regulars to remove rebellion pieces. Skirmish can be conducted in three ways. The first option allows the British faction to remove one rebellion piece, whether it be an active militia, a continental, or a French regular. The second option allows the removal of two rebellion game pieces, but at the cost of losing one British regular as a casualty. And finally, the third option can only be conducted if a Patriot fort is left undefended in a game space. A skirmish can remove that fort, but it costs the British faction one regular as a casualty. The Patriot version of skirmish works nearly the same as the British version. The Patriots can use their Continentals, the Blue Cubes, to skirmish in any province where a battle command has not taken place. And once again, they have three options. The Patriots can use their Continentals to remove one enemy cube, or remove two enemy cubes and lose one Continental, or if a British fort is left in a space undefended, that fort can be skirmished out, but cost the Patriots one Continental as a casualty. The French faction's version of skirmish nearly mirrors the Patriot version with a few exceptions, and those would be that a skirmish by the French faction cannot be conducted in a space where a battle, French agent mobilization, or muster command has been conducted. The abilities to remove British cubes and British forts remains the same as the Patriots. The Indian faction does not conduct a skirmish. Instead, they can go on the warpath. The main difference here is that the Indian faction must activate a number of war parties in the eligible space to remove rebellion pieces. Activate one war party, and a warpath special activity can remove one rebellion piece, whether it be an active militia, a continental, or a French regular. Activating two war parties can remove two rebellion pieces at the cost of one war party as a casualty. Finally, if a rebellion fort is left undefended, a war path can eliminate it, but at the cost of one war party as a casualty. The Patriots have their own version of the war path special activity for their militia units, except it's called Partisans. The Partisan Special Activity can be used in any space except where a battle command has been played. The three options are the inverse of what we've just seen for Warpath except this time against British and Indian units. Now let's learn how factions can block other factions' game pieces. The British have a command called Garrison that allows them to protect cities, activate militia, and displace enemy units. This command costs two total resources and can only be used in a city that has not been blockaded by the French. Garrison provides a number of benefits to the British faction. First, Garrison allows the British to move their regulars from any space to cities as long as the cities involved are not blockaded. Then the regulars can reveal militia located in that city at a 3 to 1 ratio. For every three regulars, one militia is flipped from underground status to active status. Finally, if desired, in one city that must be British controlled, have no Patriot forts and not be blockaded, displace all rebellion units to an adjacent space. As you can see, garrison can be a very powerful command for the British faction. The next pair of special activities are called naval pressure and relate to the French faction's use of their squadrons to blockade cities and the British faction's ability to remove these ships. 
An important note, naval pressure and applying blockades can only be conducted after the Treaty of Alliance. The naval pressure special activity allows the French to take one available French squadron from the West Indies, flip it over to the blockade side, and place it on a city of their choice. This activity also raises the French Naval Intervention Level, or FNI, by one. As you may have noticed earlier, a blockaded city can prevent the British faction from placing their regulars in cities or conducting garrisons amongst other annoyances. Now let's look at the British version of naval pressure. This special activity for the British faction is basically the inverse of the French version. When the British faction conducts a naval pressure special activity, it removes one blockade from a city of their choice and sends that French squadron back to the West Indies. This also lowers French naval intervention, or FNI, by one level. As you can see, the French can continually harass the British faction with naval pressure and force them to use special activities and their own naval pressure to reopen those cities. This creates quite a bit of contention between the British faction and the French faction. One additional special ability of naval pressure for the British is they can use it in absence of French blockades to increase their resources. The amount of resources gained is dependent on whether it is before or after the Treaty of Alliance is played. Before the Treaty of Alliance, the British can use naval pressure to receive two resources. After the Treaty of Alliance is played, if the French naval intervention level is zero, then the British can play naval pressure, roll a d3, and claim that amount in resources. Now, let's look at ways to enrich factions and gain resources. First, let's look at how the French faction can transfer their resources and enrich their patriot comrades. This command is called Rodrigue Hortelez et Compagnie, or in my horrible French, Rodriguez Hortelez and Company. Historically, this was a Spanish trading company and French front for funneling supplies to the Patriots. When the French faction conducts this command, the cost in resources is the amount that will be transferred from the French to the Patriots. This command increases the Patriot funds by the amount transferred plus one resource. This command is useful because it allows the French faction to prop up the Patriots' finances. Similar to the French command that allows them to enrich the Patriots, the Indians can initiate trade with the British to gain their resources. Once the Indian and British faction negotiate the amount of resources to exchange, they must choose an eligible space that contains at least one war party and a village. The Indian faction then activates that one war party and the transfer takes place. The British faction reduces their resources by the agreed amount and the Indians gain the commiserate amount in resources. A special note, if the Indian faction initiates a trade and the British faction refuses to play along, they can still gain one resource. The Patriots can gain their own resources by using the Persuasion Special Activity. This special activity can be chained to any command but costs the Patriots one propaganda marker. By using this special activity, the Patriots can select up to three colonies or cities with rebellion control and militia present. For every militia activated, the Patriots gain two resources and can do this a maximum of three times. The Indian faction has their own variation on the influence special activity called Plunder. This special activity can be chained to any command but costs the Indians one raid marker. By using this special activity, the Indians can select up to three provinces with active or passive opposition and an underground war party. They then activate that war party and gain resources from the Patriot faction equal to that space's population. This in essence gives the Indian faction a chance to rob the Patriot faction. Now, let's look at ways that factions can use commands to influence the population. 
the Indian faction can conduct the raid command to reduce opposition at a cost of one resource per destination space. They may select up to three provinces with active or passive opposition that contain an underground war party. The Indian faction then activates that war party and places a raid marker. This shifts the influence level of that space one level towards neutral. Remember, neutral is as high as a raid can push the influence. To go higher, an eligible territory would need the British faction to reward loyalty, which we saw earlier in their place unit section. The Patriot faction can conduct the rabble-rousing command to neutralize support and build opposition at a cost of one resource per destination space. They may select any space with rebellion control and gain pieces, or one or more underground militia. The Patriot faction then places a propaganda marker. If only an underground militia unit is present, then they need to activate that militia. Then the Patriot faction shifts the influence level of that space one level towards opposition. Now that we've covered off on the commands and special activities, you should begin to understand the various game actions needed to meet your particular faction's objectives. In the next tutorial in this series, we will walk through the Winter Quarters period. Until then, I'm Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode. Questions about this game, requests for future Harsh Rules game tutorials, and constructive feedback are all greatly appreciated. Drop a line in the comments section. To be the first notified when this episode and any Harsh Rules episode is placed online, please subscribe to this channel. Until then, I'm Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode.